Hey everybody, this is Rod Morgenstein and I'm on Musicians on the Record today, so hit it. On the record, bring it on! My guest today on the show is legendary great drummer Rod Morgenstein, who's been rocking for a long time with bands such as the Dixie Dregs, Winger, Jazz is Dead, and Jelly Jam. He's also been an educator and a music professor at the Berklee School of Music for over 20 years and has written several books, The Drum Set Musician and Drum Set Warm-Ups, just to name a few. Here's my time with Rod. Welcome to the show, Rod. Great to be here. Thank you. Absolutely. Great. Well, there's a lot that we're talking about here that you've had a, a long and uh, great career so far. Still more to go, obviously. But can we start with where did it start for you, your musical story? How did music come into your life at the beginning? It happened on a Sunday night when Ed Sullivan mm. said, ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to remember if maybe it was February 1964. Mm -hmm. um, I was glued to my seat, and that was it. There was no looking back. Um, their music changed my life. And for whatever reason, mm. uh, I was identifying mostly with Ringo and the drumming, and I told my parents, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, it's fantastic. So many people have said the same thing. I mean, so inspirational, so foundational with the Beatles. Anything in particular that really caught you that day, really hooked you with their performance? You know, with music, it's very difficult to pinpoint what it is within a particular kind of music that's reaching your heart on such a deep level. Yeah. Um, they all seem to be enjoying themselves. Uh, he had a, he, Ringo played with a very, almost like a Muppet style yeah. <laughs> about him, <laughs> very in, infectious, you know, and yeah. uh, I, I remember when my parents little by little would buy me a, a bass drum and a snare and then mm. added, you know, a hi-hat and a ride cymbal and a tom, I, I guess like a lot of kids just try to emulate. Mm the way he looked behind a drum set. Right. So was it one of those Ludwig kits? It sure was. Yeah. My dad took me to New York City to 48th Street, yeah. and we went to Manny's. Yeah, okay. And that's, that's where it all began. And it was a... I don't remember what the line was, mm -hmm. the particular line of Ludwig drums, but it was a black lacquered kit. Wow. And um, the original drums that we got it were turned out to be um a 12 i believe or maybe 14 by 20 inch bass drum wow and uh, so it was very narrow yeah it had a telescoping very thin cymbal rod ah interesting and it came with a 10 inch cymbal <laughs> which i still have really oh that's great um and a snare drum so that that was the original setup yeah. And, um, you know, as they saw that my interest did not wane, that I was still very excited after a couple of months, they then got me a ride cymbal and a hi hat, mm -hmm. and little by little, then yes. eventually a rack tom, yeah. which, which really um, was mounted on a snare stand, on another snare stand. Yeah. yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then I had my first drum set and in fact I have that drum set which I'll tell you about I'll tell it yeah next. absolutely okay we'll tell that later yeah so the the drum set grew uh, from there obviously your family saw that you were serious do you come from a musical family anybody else play music uh, as a little girl my mom played the violin mm. so she she's definitely the one with the talent she's yeah. the one who still at 93, she claps her hand on the, you know, on the two and four. Yeah, yeah. And it's my dad who claps on one and three. 
<laughs> well, she's, she's the one with the musical talent. Yeah. Although, at at 82 years of age, my dad took up the clarinet because he wanted to become a klezmer. Wow. Clarinetist, and he he stuck with it mm, till his late 80s, and then because of uh, a tear, mm. uh, yeah. He had to uh, give it up. Yeah, impressive though. At 82, picking up an instrument—that's fantastic. Yeah. 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 So everybody's got a different rhythm, whether on they're on two or four or one and three, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> so who? So you got the set? Did you just play on your own? Were you self-taught? Were there some important teachers that came into your life from that point? Uh, all right. Okay. My first band hmm. was with my friend Ken Gross. He played the baritone horn. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why he he didn't bring the baritone horn to my house. We would drag my drums. Yeah. But I... <laughs> and so he and I, I guess that was my first power duo, you know. I see. 30, 30 or 40 years before the Rudis Morgenstein project. There you go. There you go. And what really does a baritone horn play but you know boom boom, <laughs> right. boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So we did a lot of marches i see okay <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first band i guess yeah and i think maybe a year or so into things uh, my parents found me a wonderful uh drum set teacher in hicksville new york his name was Howie Mann, mm. and he was a terrific big band drummer. Nice. Um, he had a, he had this nice little studio in his home, and so uh, I studied with him probably at least for four years, maybe close to five years. Mm. And uh, you know, he really was the one that opened my eyes up to so many different aspects of the drum set, uh, from playing along with. Uh, Big band music of uh, Count Basie and Woody Herman, yeah. And uh, while at the same time, you know, showing me how you read drum charts, mm. uh, and important, then, very important. Yeah, and yeah. then along with it, the snare drum reading, and uh, and then all you know, all the different things, you know, fills and mm -hmm. grooves on the drum set. So yeah. he really uh, has to be credited with. Uh, mm. um, getting me started on the right foot absolutely sounds like a great foundation that you had learning all of those things is if we just fast forwarded to the present for a second are those some of the things that you teach as a professor at berkeley as well i i, I would say yeah in my own way um because i base most of my teaching around my 40 years of living the life Mm. of being a recording and touring musician because um you know what i've learned uh through the years of i don't know how many concerts i've played in mm. however many countries that i've been to mm. and uh similarly being in so many different recording studios and recording situations working with a lot of different producers and engineers not everything that you learn in the books translates uh. what happens in real life okay and um i mean here what just i think a really good example of this was i remember taking a course in college um you know that that spent some time uh talking about the recording process mm -hmm. and you know when you're recording make sure that uh, when you're looking at the, the levels mm -hmm. at the um that nothing is ever pinned into the red. Yeah, I'm checking mine right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. So, you know, so years later, I found myself uh, with the Dixie Dregs recording out in California, and we were working with one of the the biggest names in engineering and production, a mm. man by the name of Ken Scott, who he cut his teeth uh, working at Abbey Road Studios, did some of the Beatles records. He was the lead engineer on the Beatles White Album. Wow. Then, uh, you know, went on to do David Bowie, Elton John, Super Tramp. And then he was the engineer and producer on all of those breakout 
fusion records of mm. Billy Cooper's Spectrum, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, wow. yeah. Inner Mining Flame, uh, Birds of Fire, yeah. Jeff Beck, mm. uh, Stanley Clark's mm. breakout album. Yeah. So he did everything. And so, so one day, uh, we were working on the drum tracks, and uh, I came in to the control room to listen back to something, and I was loving <laughs> what it was sounding like, mm. but I, I looked at the meters mm -hmm. and they were pinned mm. in, into the red, you know, yeah. and I went, Ken, Ken, the meters. Yeah. And he looked at me and he said, what's the problem? I said, well, when I was in school, yeah. <laughs> I learned that you're not supposed to do that. Yeah. And he looked at me, you know, with an interesting look and he said, do you like the way it sounds? I said, it sounds amazing. And then he said, <laughs> Who cares You're what the ears right. are doing? Like yeah. ultimately, let your ears be your guide. So mm. there's just a, an interesting lesson in that. Yeah. And I'm not poo-pooing <laughs> books because right. I've written I've written drum books. Yeah. Before. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but all I'm saying is that um, there might be times that you discover that um, something that you learned might not translate. Mm. Uh, in action. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, great lesson right there. Trust your ears, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if we went back for a minute, you're you're studying with a teacher, you're playing, you're, you, it sounds like you're getting together with friends in a band. When did that first sort of big break come that you felt like, oh, I can do this more than just this and get a regular job. I can actually go for it. What was that moment for you? Mm hmm uh, well, you know, through my teenage years, uh, I was always playing in a band with my buddies, and we would invariably, invariably play in battles of the bands. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, you know, we didn't, we certainly didn't always win, mm -hmm. um, but we always did pretty well. On some occasions, we'd win the battle of the bands, mm -hmm. and you know, the feedback was always very nice. And on occasion. You know, some relatively famous person would be one of the judges. Wow. And um, I remember when one of my bands uh, played, you know, the finals at, um, I think it was, you, you wouldn't know this area, but in yeah. the, the yeah. Nassau County finals in Eisenhower Park, this beautiful band shell, you know, with the grass lawn and a couple of thousand people out there. And um, even though we didn't win it, I remember one of the judges who was a very famous jazz pianist. His name might have been Billy Mitchell. Mm -hmm. It came over to us when it was over, and he said, "Boys, I don't know. If, I don't remember if he said to us, you really, you know, were the stars of this show, mm -hmm. or if there was something more like, you have a bright future ahead of you. Wow. Like, That's great. Follow, follow the course. Sure. You know, so that was uh, probably was maybe seventeen years old wow yeah but i you know i mean i was like most teenagers where if you played a musical instrument maybe you got to a point where um someone said hey get yourself a tuxedo and you know we can maybe find you some weddings and bar mitzvahs to play so you know i did a few of those and then um i went to a, a community college for my first two years and I majored in music at Nassau Community College and had wonderful teachers there that really gave me a great background mm. in music theory. When you take private drum lessons, you're not necessarily learning about the, the two other main ingredients of music, which are harmony and melody. Mm. Um, you're basically learning all things rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, I'm also a piano player. so um, ah, Okay, cool. You know, I had a working knowledge yes. uh, yeah. in that area as well. But so I ended up going to the University of Miami in Florida for my third and fourth year to, to complete my undergraduate mm. degree. And mm -hmm. I went there because the one teacher at Nassau Community College who really was like a mentor and I looked up to, he recommended that I go there because he had gone there and he said they have an incredible music program. Mm. And so... It was in those two years as a music student that through, you know, an interesting set of circumstances, 
I met Steve Morse and the Dixie Dregs. Wow, that's great. And so um, I was actually playing piano in an improvisation class. Huh. And, uh, Steve Morse, who I, I had been admiring in the class all yeah. semester, uh, came over to me and said, hey, I know you as a piano player. Somebody told me you play the drums. I said, well, actually, the drums are really my main instrument. And wow. He asked me if I could um, fill in for his drummer mm. uh, with his band because his drummer was a surfer and had hurt himself surfing. Huh. <laughs> I said, sure. And I went to the rehearsal and here was this group of guys doing Mahavishnu Orchestra cover songs. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, and, and that was the only music I was listening to at the time. Interesting. And so I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Okay. And it turned out it was the Dixie Dregs. And, um, you know, over the course of the next year, the other drummer gracefully bowed out mm -hmm. the band. He was more of a rocker. I see. Uh, and not, not someone who was well versed like in the odd time. Yes. A great drummer. Yeah. Um, who I actually hadn't seen in so many years and uh, got together with him two summers ago in New Jersey. Oh, wow. <laughs> He's still a champion um, surfer. His name is really? Bart Yarnold. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, but so anyway, so, you know, when we, when we were getting out of, of college, we looked at each other and said, now what? You know, what's everybody planning on doing? And we just decided to collectively go for it as a band. So that probably was the point in answer to your question. Yeah, it's great. I really felt as if, you know what? This band is one of a kind, um, so special. Mm. Uh, the music doesn't sound like anything I've ever heard. Yeah. And, you know, I think we can make a go of it and get a record deal and kind of get the whole wow. thing going.